and we thought we'd give it a try. So we had no idea how many people would really be interested. So it's really quite heartening to see, you know, pretty much most of the seats filled. Um, I'm not going to try to talk any more than I absolutely have to. You guys are here really to find out the details of the game, ask questions, and sort of begin the process of having the teams work through things. So we're going to try to go quickly through any talking so that we can get right to the, the heart of things. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to spend just a real quick time doing some introductions. Um, we're going to talk about the research project. And then I have a short video that was put together by one of the partners in Wisconsin in conjunction, conjunction with the University of Wisconsin. So it explains the operation of all of the elements of the game. We'll go back through and talk a little bit more about each of the elements, give you guys a chance to ask a few questions. We'll talk about the significant rule changes that have happened this year. There are some particular rule additions and modifications with respect to teams needing to be able to work with either the RCX or the NXT-based systems. Um, and then we'll go with sort of a general question and answer as long as uh, we can suffer with the patience of our hosts. Um, so before we get started, the video will be getting posted on Google Video. So Glenn and Albert have taken the time and effort to get things put together so that that can happen. So if you want to go back and look at things again, it'll all be there. Uh, the presentation itself will also end up getting posted under the NCA FLL website. Um, so ncafll.org uh, 2006 kickoff slides.pdf. It's not there yet. Um, I couldn't finish them until after they released the final details and pictures today. So I haven't had a chance to actually post them yet. But they will be there uh, in the next few days. Um, so introductions, just kind of short. Talk a little bit about playing at learning. Some of you know who we are, and some of you don't know who we are. And so I want to give you guys a quick little bit. Um, Glenn introduced himself. There are three other Google employees that had a real strong hand in having this happen. I want to make sure we, we identify them and thank them. Um, we're going to have a t-shirt design contest this year. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about some of the things that are going to happen with the awards that will be at the, the what they're now calling the championship tournament. Uh, playing and learning. So that's basically a small nonprofit. Uh, for all intents and purposes right now, it's my wife and I. Um, we got into this side of things sort of in a roundabout way. But basically, we're your partners for First Lego League, Junior First Lego League, and First Vex Challenge. And so we're, we are first representatives for Northern California for those three programs. Um, we are a, a 501c3 nonprofit, which means that all the donations are tax deductible. So, hint, 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 hint. Uh, we are all a volunteer. We have no salaried staff. We don't pay anybody anything. We cover our expenses. All the tournaments are run as break-evens. So what monies we collect, what things we're looking for are all geared towards covering the costs only. Um, the other big thing we, we we're trying to really stress is this idea of community-based. And so we see events like this as the beginnings of a community. First Lego League in Northern California has been sort of clusters of small communities. We'd like to see a lot more opportunities for everybody to come together. And so this is sort of a first real effort at doing something like that. Because up until now, the only time everybody's come all together has been at the end of the season. And it's only a fraction of the teams. It's not something for everybody. Um, our Google hosts, there are four of them. Albert Bodenhammer, who was here earlier. I don't know if he's here now. <laughs> Glenn Terwitt. And then Emily Nishi. She actually works as, as part of their um, diversity. Hiring and diversity. And she's been our sort of main sponsor. And then Amber Issa helped take care of doing a lot of the facilities setups for us. And is in Korea, so she couldn't be here. <laughs> and apparently is in Korea at the moment. Um, so every year there's been some sort of a t-shirt as part of the program. We thought this would be a great way of beginning a, a real community effort. So what we'd like to propose is a t-shirt design contest. The basic idea is, is that each team can submit one or more designs as candidates for t-shirts for the first Lego League t-shirt, the official first Lego League t-shirt for Northern California. And the idea is to post them on a website, 
have the community vote what they like. The team that submits the design that gets the most votes will get free shirts. And then we'll offer for sale shirts to the rest of the community as a way of raising funds to help pay for the, the tournaments. And you notice it is plural. We'd like to see these kind of efforts support not just the state tournament, but as much as possible, all the qualifiers. Um, we have this continuous problem where we're all approaching the same companies. We're all approaching the same donors. So if we can find ways of c communicating and cooperating um, and leveraging the larger effort, we can get more money out of fewer places, basically. <clears throat> um, in terms of what we're looking at awards-wise at the official tournament, it's going to be very similar to last year. Um, so if you're new to First Lego League and you're not sure what the awards are, the Coach's Handbook is a great resource. It explains all the awards. Some of them will be awards that are going to be at the tournament. Some of them are optional awards we give depending upon uh, how things look for a particular year. Um, we have three awards that we've started giving that we need nominations for. And so throughout the season, if you see people that you feel are deserving of an outstanding coach or mentor award, or are really doing above and beyond in terms of outreach for First Lego League, or are really going above and beyond as an outstanding volunteer, those are awards that come from the community. They don't have to be somebody that's at the Northern California tournament. We like to recognize you know, the, what the community sees. And so we'd like to have nominations from you. Give us a reason why. Why does this person deserve this award? And so we'll, we'll set up an email address where those nominations can be mailed to. And so watch the NCA FLL Yahoo group um, for announcements related to that. Um, one thing we'd really like to stress is this idea that the program is for components. It's not all about a robot running around on a table. So there's the robot, its design. There's how it performs. There's the teamwork aspect. And then there's the research project. And we'd really like, this is really probably mostly to you coaches out there, is to emphasize to the kids that, that it's really a four-pillar four program. And you really want to make sure that all parts are being addressed. It's kind of this idea that the more the kids do with the concepts that are behind the challenge, the more they're going to get from it, the, the deeper the, the learning will be. <clears throat> OK, so skipping real quick, I told you I was going to try to talk as fast as I can so we can get to the, the real uh, nitty gritty. Um, every year, the first Lego League project is going to involve basically three ideas some sort of an exploration the teams are going to do, some sort of design or solve, and then some sort of a share. So this year, the idea is to go learn about what's going on with nanotechnology, either related directly to the challenge or from the team's own readings. Um, learn about what difficulties the, team, the current researchers are facing, what kind of applications there are, what kind of new applications there could be, and come up with a solution either to an existing problem or find a way of uh, scheming up some new application of nanotechnology. Um, and then share, basically the idea is, is to spread the word, get the kids to get out there and play sort of evangelists, have them get excited about telling other people about technology. Uh, there's a, a much richer description. This is sort of the, the, the quick and dirty version of the project description. There's a much richer one. If you haven't already gone to the first Lego League website, they have now published the full description of both the project and the, um, the game. Uh, it, it did get rather swamped right around noon today. <laughs> I, ca I can't imagine why. Um, they are doing a few things this year to try to improve the resources that you guys as teams and coaches have to work with. So for everybody who's already registered and received their equipment, you got a DVD that has a bunch of examples of project presentations on it. And now you can see what kind of things that other teams have done. Um, there are several videos that were also put together at the same time as the videos I'm getting ready to show you that were put together that talk more about some of the, the aspects of, of nanotechnology. So they're great resources. And FIRST has already populated a pretty rich set of resources underneath the project area of the, the challenge website. So if you go 
into the first Lego League site and go look at the Challenge 2006, you'll find in the project section a whole long page of resources. Uh, broken down into different categories. So if the kids are looking for somewhere to start with ideas, it's a great place to begin. Okay, so this is, this is what you are, are here for, right? This is the first, first big peak. So how, how many have cheated and already gone and looked on the website? <laughs> Be honest. Okay, well that's pretty good. It's, it's good patience. Um, this video, as well as all of the challenge videos, are all hosted off of a website at, at Notre Dame. So the Notre Dame uh, faculty participated in the game design and got excited about the idea of helping host the videos as part of the kickoff. So the link is here, uh, first fll.ee.nd.edu. Um, it's also referenced underneath the resources section of the First Lego League website. Uh, with that, I'm gonna switch over real quick and run the first video. This is uh, about five and a half minutes long. It's basically uh, an element by element explanation of what's gonna happen in the game. And I'll, I'll tab. Oh, you know what? There's one important thing I forgot. I forgot it has sound. like all good technology things, it doesn't want to run. We'll try this again. Okay. Our experts are going to bring over an audio connection for us. Jacks over on this side. Yeah. Individual atom manipulation. Mission move individual atoms accurately. The robot must remove at least one white atom from the blue surface without removing any red atoms. Counting atoms left on the surface, a count of eight red atoms and seven or six white atoms is worth 30 points. A count of eight red atoms and five or fewer white atoms is worth 40 points. A count of fewer than eight red atoms is worth no points. The Snell mission. Transfer molecules from the pizza toward the nose. The robot must get pizza molecules completely off the paper plate for five points each and transferred to the yellow or black areas of the person's head or neck for an additional 10 points each. The maximum value of this mission is 30 points. Stain-resistant fabric. Mission, test some stain-resistant fabric. The robot must deliver the dirt trap to its location mark. The dirt trap at its mark is worth 15 points. Completely dump out the tester's dirt dumper. The dirt dumper, when empty, is worth 15 points. The dirt pieces are bonus objects worth five points each in the dirt trap and three points each everywhere else on the table. When removing dirt for a bonus loss, the referee takes stray pieces first, then pieces from the dumper and pieces from the trap last. Smart medicine. Mission, target medicine to reach only a specific problem spot. The robot must release the buckyball containing medicine into the person's arm. 
the buckyball placed anywhere in the person's arm bone is worth 50 points, even if it hasn't reached the problem spot. Self-assembly. Mission, start the self-alignment of atoms. The robot must cause the angled blue nanotube segments to align horizontally end to end. This alignment is worth 30 points. Molecular motor. Mission, deliver an adenosine triphosphate, ATP, molecule to power a molecular motor, causing it to spin and release energy. The robot must deliver one of the two ATP molecules through the molecular motor's black frame for 40 points, even if nothing else happens. The second ATP molecule represents a second chance to complete this mission, but points are only given for one delivered molecule. Atomic force microscopy. Mission, free the probe's nanotip. The robot must separate the nanotip from the material surface. The nanotip separated from the surface is worth 40 points. Nanotube strength. Mission, lift the truck by a thin cable of carbon nanotubes. The robot must move the truck onto the lift frame. The truck completely on the frame is worth 20 points. Activate the lift. The truck and frame supported completely and only by the cable is worth an additional 20 points. The maximum value of this mission is 40 points. Space elevator. Mission operate the space elevator. At least one robot must cause the car with the yellow cargo to come down. If this mission is completed, no matter which robot or robots worked on it, both teams get 40 points. The bonus section? I don't know if I can. Let's see. At 40 points. I don't, uh, I was going to try to replay the last section. This is a freeware little uh, viewer of the flash video format that they've used for these videos. It's maybe not the best. I didn't have a lot of time to go looking. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of that. We'll go back to the slides um, and we can talk about it. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna skip forward and we'll talk about that last issue. The fairness bonus. Um, so Scott Evans, our, our wonderful game designer, decided that maybe there was a little difference between an RCX and an NXT in, an, in an effort to try to level the playing field. He says, maybe there's not a lot of difference. Maybe there's just a little. And so the fairness bonus is, is a new element to the game this year. Um, with an RCX, to, to score the fairness bonus, you must score points in any three of the missions. With NXT, you have to score points in six of the missions. Now, I, I, I see a little bit of an issue. We'll have to see what the, um, the Q&A says related to the bonus objects and how they count into the tally of missions um, and, and how that actually fits. But so that's going to be an interesting one to see how that plays out. Um, so I'm going to skip right ahead to rule changes. We'll come back to the other slides in a few minutes as we start getting into the question and answers. Um, 
for the most part, a lot of the rules look very similar. The, the changes start to come into play when you start looking at rotation sensors and total number of sensors. So because the NXT has a rotation sensor in every motor, the RCX is allowed to use up to three rotation sensors as well. Um, because you don't have to use three NXT motors, the NXT is allowed to, if it's not using its full complement of motors, is allowed to use some of the old rotation sensors if they wish. And so it's kind of an odd wording of the rule. But so that basically the, the end impact is, is that neither robot can have more than three rotation sensors on it, and neither robot can have more than three motors on it. Now, because the NXT can have more, mo more sensors plugged into it, they've also allowed an option of a third sensor. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's actually it's a third sensor, meaning if you add it up before, you used to be allowed two touch or two light. Now you can have either a third light or a third touch. And so if you wanted to figure out how to try, try to take advantage of those, that option is there for you. Um, and they have gone ahead and, and allowed the ultrasonic sensor for the NXT this year as well. Um, it is possible that these will change. Like all good rules, they get adjusted a little as the season goes. So like for all the game missions, relying on the Q&A is the right way to go. That's going to be the final test, the final check of everything that's involved. Uh, there are some other NXT-specific rules. Uh, no Bluetooth. Um, there's just too many questions about what can or can't be done with Bluetooth in a tournament environment. Um, and so for the sake of simplicity, there just isn't any. It's not allowed. Not in the pits, not in the competition area. And so all connections to the robots will be done either with the infrared tower for the RCX robots or with the USB cable for the NXT robots. Um, and then there's that, that special odd rule about the rotation sensors. Um, we're trying to record all this, and so I'm going to go ahead and we'll move real quick into questions and answers so that we can you know, not, not try the patience of our hosts any more than we have to. Um, I'm going to, when you ask a question, I'm going to repeat the question so that we can capture it on the video. Um, and what I'd like is if you've got a question, if you could stand up and come to the, the either of the three sort of aisle ways, and that would be an easy way for me to make sure that I get everybody's questions answered. Um, we do have a couple other folks here that are familiar with the game, so I may point at a few people to help answer questions as we go as well. Yes? So a question about Space Elevator. Yes, sir. Uh, since it requires both hands to be triggered for the elevator to operate, uh, the, the question is, can your robot reach and uh, trigger the other side? Or does the old rule still stand of no part of the robot actually getting out of the it, it, the way it's written, it says at least one robot. So to me, that implies that one robot doing it is sufficient. So if we think back, there was a similar mission a couple years ago in Mission Mars that had um, two halves of a habitation module that could be connected together. In that challenge, it was allowed for the robot to reach across. Uh, in this case, they kind of turned a blind eye to that. You can't reach into the other table rule because it was a beneficial um, interference, not negative interference. And so I'll, my assumption would be that that's the way that'll get addressed in the Q&A, but the Q&A will be the final say on it. Um, I'm sure that question's gonna come up very quickly. Sir. So the, the question was, is what if the elevator doesn't go down when the mechanisms get activated? So there, if you haven't looked real closely at it, there's two little hooks, one on each side. And so it is possible the model's not going to work. The referee is likely going to make a decision based on whether or not the two sides have been pushed sufficiently. If the model doesn't work, but the robots on two sides or one side or whatever have activated the mechanism, he's likely going to give you the benefit of the doubt um, and award the points. Way in the back there. It's not deducted, you won't earn, right? The, 
the, the question was, is will any points get deducted if the truck falls off? And so if you read the way the challenge is written, the truck must be on, raised up by the red platform and hung from the cable in order to score the points. So it's not that they get deducted, you don't earn them. So does it have to go all the way into? The, the question is, is for the, the fairness bonus, is it that you have to complete the mission? In other words, do I have to score all the points available for that mission? And the answer is no. The way it's written, my interpretation of the answer is it'll again be the Q&A will be the final definition of all these. <laughs> uh, it's score points. The way it's actually written is must score points in missions. It doesn't actually say must score all points in missions. So in the case of the pizza molecule, getting one pizza molecule off of the plate is enough to score points in that mission, and that would be sufficient to count that mission as part of the, the three missions for the RCX, or the six for the NXT. Sir? What's the maximum amount of points you can get? Uh, the maximum, the question is what's the maximum number of points? Uh, I believe it's 400. Uh, Scott Evans has tried to set the games up to be 400 every year. So the, the, question, the question is a complicated long one. It's, it's worth spending the time to make sure I, I describe it right. Um, in the case of the stain resistant fabric, you've dumped. So the, the robot has caused the little dump to empty, but it didn't empty completely. There's like one piece left. But sometime later, the referee uh, assesses a touch penalty, a touching the robot out of base penalty, and takes that piece away. Does the dumper now count as being empty? So interestingly, we, we, the tournament partners all think like you guys do. And so that was one of the first questions that the tournament partners asked is, gee, that seems like an easy way to score 15 points. Um, I believe that'll get addressed in the Q&A. And it is a, an issue of how it gets emptied. And so it must get emptied by robot action, not by human action. And so in this case, because you touched the robot, the team member touched the robot and scored a penalty, that doesn't count as the robot having emptied the dumper. And so my guess would be, no, it doesn't count now as empty. It's still full. No. <laughs> Bragging rights, satisfaction of a job. Well, uh, the question is, what do you get if you win the tournaments? Uh, bragging rights, the satisfaction of a job well done, uh, trophies and plaques. Just depends on what tournament you're going to. Everybody's got slightly different at the qualifying level, the first level of tournaments. Everybody has a slightly different strategy for how they manage awards, and they're not all the same. At the, the championship level, we have these really cool Lego trophies they let us give out. They're very, very neat looking. And, and know that you can't take them apart, they're glued together. <laughs> Just a second. You had, you had a follow-up question on the, the dumper. I, I guess my only, uh, my only thought was that in, in all this, they say that it's the state of the board at the end that determines the scoring. And it seems like, I mean, there's all kinds of ways that, that things can get changed during the process, and et cetera, et cetera. So if that's the rule, it seems like that would hold. So the, the, the question is basically the, the, the uh, it's like more a comment than a question. The comment is, the way the rules are written, it's the scoring is all based on the state at the end of the game. So it's, it's when the two and a half minutes have expired and the referee looks at the table, how does it look? Um, Scott has been very good at writing the rules and he has a few different outs he's left for himself in the rules. And there are a few different places where there's, unless the mission rules overwrite. And so there's a few places where he leaves himself doors. And I'm sure he's gonna take advantage of it because it really is supposed to be about what the robot does, not about loopholes. So he usually tries to find the loopholes early and close them. Um, and then he was actually a little surprised that we found one that quick. <laughs> sure. Um, what if one of the dirt pieces gets stuck on the net? 
the question was, what happens if one of the dirt pieces gets stuck on the net? Um, what would you guess? And you wouldn't get the points for it? Yeah. You, would you get the points for it on the table? So it would count as being out of the dumper, yeah. so it's still a three-point object. It's a bonus object, but it's not a five-point object because it's not in the dirt track. Correct. And I understand that it's possible for these ultrasonic sensors and two or more in the same room can actually interfere with each other and whether or not that's something that needs to be taken into consideration when designing a robot. So the, the question was, is the NXT kits have ultrasonic sensors and there are some concern that uh, two robots both equipped with ultrasonic sensors might interfere with each other and whether that there needed to be something done to the robot or to the environment that the robot's in to adapt to that. It's a fear more than anything. Nobody's actually seen it happen to know that it does happen. Um, it's going to be an interesting season. <laughs> Way in the back. The, the question is, is, is the allowed electrical equipment going to change um, the, the com because of the comment I made about the rules changing? Uh, I don't believe they're going to change the equipment rules. Um, that, there's nothing to say that they might not. I doubt if they made any changes that they would make them more restrictive. If anything, they would probably make them less restrictive. Uh, but that'll be something we'll see. Yes? How does the buckyball molecule get onto the robot? The, the question was, is how does the buckyball molecule get onto the robot? Um, in every season, there's a few objects that are deliverables that start in the base. The buckyball will be one of those objects that starts in the base. Um, and as a deliverable in base, it can be handled by the team. So the team may place it onto the robot into some sort of mechanism on the robot, uh, lay it down in front of the robot, whatever they deem necessary for their robot to accomplish its task. But they, they can't, by their action, put it in the, the bone. The robot has to do that. So they can load it while it's in base, and then the robot does its, its work. Sir. OK, um, if you're not familiar with the NXT, it has places to connect three motors and places to connect four sensors. Um, because there are rotation sensors embedded into the motors, it effectively has seven sensors that are connectable. The RCX, when you look at it at face value, has places to connect three motors and has places to connect three sensors. Um, so how do you accommodate the difference in the capabilities between the two? Um, there's all kinds of tricks that can be done to gang sensors together. Um, if you go out on Google and search and look for you know, uh, Mindstorm sensor tricks, you'll find all kinds of ways of being able to put more than the, the obvious three onto the robot. And so it's more of an allowance for whatever creativity a team can come up with. Um, than a, a hard and fast, this is how you do it. Um, and also reconfigure during the that, that Exactly. Um, it is possible to have a different attachments. The comment that came from the back was is you, you can reconfigure the robot dynamically during the, the round. So one attachment might have a light sensor on it. Another attachment might have a light sensor and a, and a touch sensor. A third attachment might have, so the whole set of things you use during the two and a half minutes may be a lot more than what you could have used, for example, last year but it still would maybe only be three at a time. Sir. So the, the, the comment was is uh, if we kept the NXT ultrasonic sensor down at like um, edge of the table level so that it's effectively below the walls of the table, maybe it wouldn't interfere. And I don't know whether or not that's true. Uh, like I said, it's going to be a real interesting season. We're going to find out. And probably it's going to be one of you folks out here 
that finds out before any of us do. Right? Way in the back. So the question was, is uh, um, can you drive around the, uh, the stain resistant fabric and dump from the back? Um, the general thing I always tell anybody who asks questions about the game rules is if it doesn't say you can't, think that you can. So if there was nothing in the rules that specifically prohibited you from doing it, why, say, why think that you can't? So I don't think there's anything in any of the rules that says you have to approach any of these models from any particular side. So whatever you can come up with ought to be fun to work and fun to see. Uh, right here. Yeah. The question was is, is the dirt trap that's part of the, un the stain resistant fabric, is it part of the deliverables? That's correct. It starts in the base as something the robot must deliver. So you'll have to have your robot figure out how to get the, the dirt trap over to the stain resistant fabric. The question is, is, does the dirt in the dirt trap, so before being dumped, yeah. count as points as part of the fairness bonus? And that's a question we're going to have to see in the Q&A. Um, maybe, maybe it'll boil down to this difference between the robot scoring points and the team scoring points. <laughs> and so you could think, one way to think about it might be that the um, dirt in the trap scores points regardless of what the robot does. And so if the fairness bonus says the robot must score points in three missions, then if it's all in the trap, the robot hasn't scored points. So I don't know. That's, I'm sure, is going to come up in the Q&A, and that'll be the place to look for the definitive answer to that. Yes? Uh, the question was, is there a limit on the number of gearboxes you can use on your robot? The only limits that have been expressed are about the electrical pieces. So other than that, if it's made by Lego, pretty much you can use it. Ma'am. What's the difference between an RCX and an NXT? <laughs> a big question with the, just a few words. What's the difference between an RCX and an NXT? Um, the, there are many differences. Um, it is a different electrical equipment, different hardware, different motors, different sensors, different main brain brick, different software environment to use for programming it in. Um, that said, I, aside from the sensors that are new to the, R, to the NXT, I've not seen anything that can't be accomplished with either. Right? So the, it's just a different way of accomplishing the task. It's newer. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how the teams decide which way to go. Um, it's a to go really into detail would take a lot more time than we've got tonight. Um, I'll, I'll go with Glenn. The, the emptying the, the, the dirt trap, I assume you get points even if you don't even make an effort to get the collection box over there. Um, uh, I would assume that, so the question was is for the, the dirt, the stain resistant fabric, dumping the dumper scores points potentially regardless of whether or not the dirt trap is there. And I think that's, that's probably true. Um, the dirt trap just gives you the option of effectively adding a little extra points to the, the, dirt, mo the, the dirt molecules or whatever they're calling them. Sir. So the question, I, I, think I, I think I understand. The question is, can you use a Lego remote? Yeah. And then he, he paused while I'm testing it out. So if it stays at home and never comes to any tournament, yes. Um, at the tournaments, they'll ask you to walk out with it. Um, the problem with the Lego remotes is, is they don't control just your robot. They control everybody's robot. <laughs> 
the, you, you press that A motor on button and everybody, A motor turns on. <laughs> so they, they are, you know, no, no, don't, you, you can do what you want to at home, but it doesn't go to tournaments. Sir. Okay, so there, it's a long question. There's, um, the question was, is if a, a model, one of the elements on the field gets broken, what happens? And it depends a lot on how and when it gets broken and how it happens. Um, the robot drives out, crashes into something, and, it, and the something falls apart. Um, depends on the model, depends on the conditions, depends on the situation, the referee may reset it. If the referee has seen that you've crashed into three or four things before that, he may decide that that's part of your strategy and may just leave it. <laughs> um, as an example, if you have, um, say we're looking at the test the carbon fiber, the, the nanotube fiber. If you've successfully gotten the truck up and your robot drives into it and crashes it and knocks the truck off, the ro that's, referee is not going to come back out and put the truck back on. But now say in, in reaching out to retrieve your robot, when it was over near the truck, you dragging your robot knocked the truck off. The referee likely would put the truck back. So there's a lot of detail behind how and why and what happened and you know, how long it's going to take to fix things, whether or not it's going to get in the way of your game. So it's not a simple answer. Uh, a lot of it depends on the situation. Sir. Um, the question is, is del when delivering the dirt trap for the stain resistant fabric, does the dirt trap have to be fully on the mark? Um, I would suggest reading the rather detailed descriptions of in, on, at, uh, there's a couple other words. S Scott Evans has spent some time defining those words. And he's very careful about defining them. Um, and the rules for the missions are all written around those definitions of those words. Uh, I believe the rule is, in this case, the word he uses is at. It must be at its mark. And I believe the way that it, that ends up being interpreted is the some part of the dirt trap must cross into some part of the mark. It doesn't have to be exact. It doesn't have to be you know, lined up and close. It needs to be covering part of the area inside. That's what it kind of boils down to. Yes, sir. So the, the question was, is, is when, I, when the robot is unsticking the, the nanoprobe, what happens if the whole model flips up? That's something you're going to have to watch for. Um, that is a potential problem. The mats are flexible. That's going to be true for everybody everywhere. And so that's maybe a consideration you have to take into account when you, you and your team get together and design your solution to that. Um, it is part of the way that that model is built and designed. He, he specifically talked about it when he was explaining the challenge to all of us. And he said, you guys might be tempted to put some extra sticky tape under there. He said, don't. OK, so we're not going to. Yes? Um, the question was about the robot starting position and the method of starting the robot um, and the recent spate of changes in the rules related to that. Um, Scott did a lot of work in the last year's rules in cleaning a lot of the language up and cleaning the method up. And I don't believe there's any significant changes in that section in coming into this year. Uh, it's basically the same rule, 
the, the team must stop touching the robot before it begins leaving base. And so if the robot is in motion and the kids are touching it, that's, that's an issue. The, it, basically, it's a dem it, it gets a lot harder when you're actually in the tournaments and it's a live, active situation. Referees, in general, are trained to give you the benefit of the doubt. So close calls are going to go to the team. But if it's an obvious, you know, they're re-aiming the robot as it's leave, getting ready to leave base, the referee is going to rightly ask them to stop and bring it back and restart it again. Sir. Yeah, I had a uh, follow-up on the, the dirt dumper and the bonus toss. Uh-huh. I understood, just to reiterate, if you leave a dirt piece in the dumper, then you get a bonus loss that takes the last piece out, you say no point for the dumper. If you... Um, the bonus loss first, and then you come and dump the rest of them out. Would that be the same thing? Be the same thing? OK, so the question is, related to the bonus loss and the empty dumper, if the referee takes a, 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 a dirt piece out of the dumper, but there's still dirt there, and then later the robot causes the dumper to empty, does it still count as an empty dumper? And uh, again, I think that's probably going to be one that comes down to the Q&A. I would tend to believe that, the, that that's going to count as empty dumper. The robot caused the dumper to be empty. The assumption would be that if that other piece of dirt was still there, it would have come out. It's kind of hard to know. Um, that's definitely going to be one, a good one for the Q&A. Sir. Once the robot, so in general, there's a couple of rules that are really, spend some time reading them. It helps a lot in terms of how you and your team are going to decide what your strategy is. Specifically, there's a rule that says the robot cannot interact with the field in any way until it has completely left base. And so anything that would be stuck back still into base would mean it's not completely out of base. Additionally, there's a rule that says anytime a, a human touches the robot, it has to be brought back to base for a restart. Whether or not there's a touching penalty happens to fall down to where the robot actually is. Is it partially in base or is it completely out of base? If it's completely out of base and you touch it, you're going to get a, a robot retrieval penalty and be asked to bring it back. If it's, to, if it's partially in base, regardless of whether it's on its way out or on its way in, you may touch it, but you have to bring it back in before it can go out and do any other missions. So the question was, if the robot empties the dumper, but some of the pieces fall out onto the board, and the robot later goes and picks those pieces up and puts them in the dirt trap, does that count? I would say, why not? And it should be a lot of good cheering going on, too, right? <laughs> Way in the back. So the question was, is what if the mission model breaks during the mission? Um, we kind of touched on that a little earlier. It depends on how and why. So if it's obvious to the referee that it wasn't the fault of the team, he's likely to try to repair it. That said, there's some of these models that are pretty complex. If they break in complex ways, he may not be able to repair it. And that's something that will have to be addressed at the time by the people involved. Each referee will make the call based on what they see. If the team crashes into something and breaks it, it's going to depend on whether it looked like an accident, whether it looked like it was strategy. It's kind of a gray area. Good rule is, is to try to be careful around the models. So the, the way the scoring, so the question was, is for the molecular motor, if the robot causes the, the mechanism to spin but doesn't actually drop the molecule to, to make it happen, uh, does it still count? 
And uh, the thing to do is to actually read carefully the description of that mission. It isn't about the mechanism moving. It's about the molecule passing through the, that black frame. And so until that molecule goes through, regardless of when or whether or not the mechanism fires and, and runs, there's no score. So it's the molecule going through that's the important piece, not the mechanism going around. That, that's just kind of icing. So, so if you do that, but then you put the, so if you made it go down with your robot and then you put the thing on it after you did it with the robot, would it count? So the, the question is, is, so say my robot did reach through and trigger the molecular motor, and then later came back and delivered the molecule, would that still count? My belief would be, yeah, right? The scoring for the mission is about, did a molecule pass through the black frame? So yeah. Yes, sir. The question is, is the robot drives out of base, runs out of batteries, and is dead. <laughs> if the team reaches out, grabs it, and pulls it back, do they still get a touching penalty? Unfortunately, the answer, I think, is yes. Right? The, the rule is clearly written about when you're allowed to interact with the robot. That might be a situation you decide whether or not it's worth it. Right? Maybe you've only got five seconds left in the mission, in, the, in your round, and you decide maybe it's not worth it. Right? Oh, I'll leave it. We'll just pick it up after the time's up. Then there's no penalty. Um, the other thing would be to make sure your batteries are good before the round. <laughs> sure. So the, the go ahead and ask them both. OK, so two questions. First question is, is, if they accidentally break one of the deliverables while it's in base, can they repair it? I don't see why not. I think that would be a good thing to do. Uh, second question was, is if they accidentally drop, accidentally or on purpose, drop a pizza molecule through the molecular motor, does that count? <laughs> And I'd have to look real closely at the rule, but my belief would be probably not. It's that the way it's written, it's actually the particular molecule, the ADP molecule. ATP molecule. Yeah, we've got to get used to the new terminology this year. So it's, it's written about that particular molecule going through. So I, I would probably guess pizza doesn't count. <laughs> Sir. So the, the, the question was, is what if the judge grabs my robot? Uh, I don't have a, a clear-cut answer to that. I don't know what the situation was. I don't, under, you know, I don't have enough information really to be able to decide what should or shouldn't have happened. Um, that's a good time to have a good conversation with your referees before the match. Talk to the referee. You know, hey, we like to do this. This might happen. Can you grab it? Don't touch it when it's doing this. So the referees are people, too. So talk to them. I mean, they're standing there all day, and they're watching all these kids go by having all the fun. And so you know, talk to them. Make them part of the fun. <laughs> Sir. Um, that's, so the question was, is it, for the self-assembling molecule, if the robot triggers and it starts and the mechanism fails partway through, are you still going to get points? Um, the definitive answer will come from the Q&A. My belief would be yes. That would be something that they would consider probably as more of a model problem. Then the robot didn't do its thing. The robot has a very clear responsibility with respect to that model. It's just tip the little arm. Right? So once it's done that, the rest of it's the model's problem. So if it doesn't finish all the way through, that's not necessarily your fault. Although maybe if you crashed into it real hard shortly before that, that might, they might make a different decision. But that would be the only way I could think of that they might not just go ahead and give you the points. Sir.
space towers between two teams. It's more like a friendly thing. Um, how they decide would they just say the tire. So the question was, is how do they decide of the two teams on the table who gets the most points? Um, I mean, it, it's, it, it's all math, right? So they just add up the points. So if, the, if both teams score all the points, both teams get a, a perfect score, and they get tied for 400, right? So in a tournament, you're not going to go with just one round. It's going to be three, four, five, depends on the tournament. Everybody should be getting at least three. So it's not just your first score, not your highest. Sometimes it's not just your first two scores. Sometimes it takes all three scores before you can really determine who, who is the winner out of the performance side. It does happen. Climb over, so tell me, tell me a little, climb over the table where? So the question was, is what happens if the robot starts to go, climb over the wall and out of the table, and the judge grabs it real quick for you? I, I, I would think you might want to thank him. <laughs> but you, you might also want to be in the right place at the right time. You are allowed to have two of your team members up at the table at all times. right? And so you know your robot. You know what can or can't happen as it's running. If you know that there's that kind of a chance, you might want to have somebody close to be ready to catch. So depending upon where you're catching, you're going to suffer a robot touching penalty, but that's certainly better than Legos on the floor. <laughs> Way in the back. Uh, the question was, is are you allowed to attach extra pieces onto an attachment onto the dirt trap to help guide in the dirt uh, pieces uh, for the stain resistant fabric. Um, in years past, Scott has had specific rulings in the Q&A about attaching things to the mission models. And so the thing to do would be to watch for that. But it falls back into that, that category of if it, if it doesn't say you can't, don't think that you can't. right? So, I, wait and see, right? Yeah. So uh, it basically, it's, it's probably going to boil down to um, does it damage the model? Is it easy for the referees to get undone? Because they're going to need to use the table real quick after that. Yeah. Question on the agenda for tonight. Um, are we also going to be covering? And so, you know, we, we can maybe after we finish with the main part of this, we can, if people are interested, we can continue on with the project. Yeah, the DVD has examples of teams giving their presentations at the, one of the New Hampshire tournaments. Um, sir. So the question is, is if there's a model on the field that's broken, and it was broken from the round before, is that my penalty? Um, hopefully that won't ever come up. It shouldn't be your penalty. Um, you as a team should look at the field before you begin. Right? This is back to that having that, that dialogue, that discussion. Talk to the referee. If you see something on the field that's wrong, bring it to the referee's attention. He's a busy guy. He's doing a lot. He's spending a lot of time you know, talking to the team before you, helping them understand their score, making sure that they agree and are happy with what went on, getting ready for the next round. It's possible something got missed. I mean, it, it happens. Um, talk to them. I mean, protect your, your best, best solution in that situation is, is for your team to protect itself. Take a look at the field as you walk up. Make sure everything looks like the way you expect. Talk to the referee in the back. Uh, the question was, is if you lose a buckyball from your um, challenge set and are looking to try to get another one, how do you get one? Um, they are the Lego Bionicle Zamorph Sphere. Um, it, it, there's a cool little shooter that actually can launch them. 
So it's very, very neat the way it works. Um, I believe Lego actually sells packages of them. I don't think they'd be orange, but in terms of size and ability to practice with one, that's what they are. The Bionicle, Xamor, Sphere, and I believe you can buy extra ones. It's like a bag of 10 or something like that. Right in here. I, I can only barely hear you. Can you stand up? So the, the, the fairness bonus, is that what you're asking? The question was, is, is the fairness bonus included as a part of the overall 400 points? And the answer is yes. So that is an aspect of the overall. In other words, there's 380 points of missions and 20 points of fairness bonus. Ma'am. The, 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 question, the question from my, why don't you stand up? This is Jill Wilker. She's my wife and the other half of Playing at Learning. She's here. She's here to heckle. Uh, the, the question was is, if people are ready to go and they're done and they feel like they've got what they want, can they get up and walk out? As long as they do it quietly and make sure that they get a Google employee to escort them down, um, by all means. So they're, they're, Glenn is in the back waving his arms. So the only thing that Google has asked is that we kind of treat the space with respect and we are escorted in and out. So if you're ready to go, um, try to keep in mind that some people aren't. So if you're going to walk out, do it kind of in a quiet way. So um, the, the comment was a reminder about when the Q&A is valid and when it'll change and how it affects your tournaments. So the Q&A as it stands at 3 o'clock the Friday before your tournament weekend is the Q&A for your tournament. So you can't look at the, at the next weekend's uh, Q&A and expect anything to happen back to your tournament. So if you want to see what the final ruling is, 3 o'clock, Scott has promised that at noon Eastern time, he will stop modifying the Q&A until the weekend's over. Um, it, it came about because a few years ago, things were getting modified all the way up till tournament day. And as tournament organizers, we didn't always know what the rulings were. And we would get brought these sheets of paper. And it's like, surprise, we've got a, a, a pass on that. And this is our interpretation. And Scott agrees. And so the, the Q&A now is the definitive answer to all questions. It's either as the challenges are written and published, or in the Q&A, or nothing. That's the only way it, it works. No, no confidential yeah. answers. All, all answers to questions are public, basically. So the question was, is for the space elevator, since the, there's this sort of implied the robot can reach across and touch the other side of the space elevator, can the robot actually go over to the other side and touch the space elevator? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it's a little bit of a liberal interpretation of uh, reach across. That'd be a good one for the q and Make Scott answer it. He, he likes good questions. So for the, the, the truck, the truck will be sitting just in front of the, the ramp. And so its front wheels should be just touching the little gray ramps that are coming down. So that it doesn't start in base. It's not a deliverable in that sense. It's part of the model. The robot's job is to push it onto and then cause the mechanism to lift. The, the question was is, after the robot completes its missions, does it have to return to base to earn its points? That would depend on the individual missions. So the only time the robot isn't required to go back to base unless it's got a retrievable, something that scores in base. Other than that, the robot can do anything it wants, anything you want. There is no such thing. There's no retrievable this year, is there? Uh, the question was is, is there a retrievable this year? I don't believe there is. There's nothing that scores based on its position in base. Everything is something that's being taken from base and given out to the models. Mm -hmm. 
So the question was, is, gee, the vinyl seems to be a little bit smaller than the table this year. How is that going to get oriented? What's the standard position? Um, that will be something that's addressed in the field setup portion of the, the documents that, that get published with the game. I believe it's all about the base corner. So the base corner will be tucked tight. So if you look at where the base is, that corner will be tucked tight in, and any excess will be at the, the edges away from the base. Um, Scott made a comment at the training about having updated the sizing of the table so that you can build a table that fits more exactly. Um, most of the places have their tables already. The big issue ends up being that they're using, for those who haven't actually looked at the mats, they're a lot different than in years past. It's no longer a laminate. It's now a uh, single surface, single material with a laser printed, I believe it's laser printed, I'm not sure, uh, baked on surface. A little tackier than years past, um, a lot more durable than years past, and will lay flat a lot quicker. Shouldn't suffer any bubbling or crimping or anything like that. Um, but along with it, they can now cut them very accurately. And so they will be, they should be a lot more precise. There shouldn't be any of the issues with the matte imaging being, matte image being a little out of angle in the matte area. So a lot of those issues should be gone. But in the meantime, they're getting the sizing figured out exactly. But that base corner is, is the, the definition of the placement of the mat in the board. That was my understanding of the way that Scott was talking, that he was rewriting the description of how you build the table to fit the properly sized mats. They had written the size of the table to allow for differences, variances in the actual cut to the mat. Um, the question was, is, is, was sort of a two-part, um, uh, noticing that there aren't any ramps or things to climb this year. Um, and was that something that was done specifically to try to address the difference between an, an NXT and an RCX? Um, and did Scott make any comments to that effect? And the answer is no, he didn't make any comments to that effect. Um, the, the why behind the game design, you'd have to talk to Scott and the folks that were behind it. Um, if you look closely at the mat, you'll see there's a sort of a red zone, a yellow zone, and a blue zone. And the way he described it was macro, micro, and nano. So there are three different zones. The activities in the different sections have corresponding scales that go along with them. Um, that was the extent of the explanations that went along with the game. Uh, I don't think he did anything explicitly to try to level the playing field. So the question was uh, a little bit more detailed about mat positioning in the table. Um, the mat is designed to have, the, it basically boils down to when we pull the mat into the corner, are we concerned about the black edge at the mat being up against the walls or the white edge just inside the black border? The mat is designed to have a black border surrounding all sides. It's the mat, not the art on the mat, that is the definition of what should be placed. So it's the, the actual vinyl mat itself, not what's printed on it that gets lined up. OK, and then a second question on the fairness bonus. Is there any indication if that would continue into the future? Because you know, to help us make a decision this year, what, you know, if we're going to try to play catch up in the future, or should we jump on it now? The, the, this question was, is the, uh, with regards to the fairness bonus, is that something that is going to continue or not? And um, nothing was actually said at the training as to whether or not that's going to be something that's going to be a part of, of the games going forward. The only thing that has been said is that the game will be designed to be accessible to both types of equipment through 2009. Now, they also did say that that may change based on the rate that the teams adopt. 
So if it's still you know, a 50-50, 75-25, and there's a significant portion of RCX teams there, they may leave that there. But if it drops down to 5%, and only 5% of the teams are, are on RCXs, they may push the rules and say, OK, you guys really ought to all switch now. And so it, it's not clear. Time will tell. But they, they have committed to, through two, 2009, largely based on the desire to support First Lego League. Whether or not it goes through 2009 will depend a lot on the First Lego League community. I think most people want to be gathering out and looking and talking at the models. So if there aren't any other questions, oh, I got one. Red and white atoms, how are they set up? Is it random or is there a pattern? The, the, P, the question was, is the red and, red and white or red and yellow? Red atoms on the platform? Ah, the red and white atoms on the, the uh, what, what's the mission called? I forget the shaky table one, the blue table with the <laughs> with the uh, red and white pieces on it. Um, there is a specific pattern, and if you look at the field setup guidelines, um, it gives very clear directions on how to set it up. Uh, basically, when you've got it set up, there's 16 pieces there. You're going to end up with a four by four grid, and there's diagonal lines of red and diagonal lines of white through it. So there's a very clear picture as part of the field setup that explains it all. And it'll be as, as good as the referees can do it uh, repeatedly. Um, the, question, the question, there was one question up here from the table about, are the little features on the mat designed to help fool light sensors? I don't think he really did anything to fool light sensors as much as to make it decorative. The, the hexagonal patterns that are there are actually modeling, uh, I believe, buckyballs, nanotubes or buckyballs, one of the two. So if there aren't any other general questions, you guys are welcome to come up and look around the table. And we can ask sort of uh, vague questions. I've got at least one more general question. Uh, yeah, don't you talk about the research, research project as well? So if people are interested in talking, so the question was is, are there people interested in talking about the research project? We can continue with that um, if people are interested. So questions about the research project. Anybody got any questions? Actually, Mark, I, I just want to make an announcement about the, our plan. So we're not, we're not done. There's still going to be more conversation about the research project, and we'll probably have to throw people out bodily, it looks like. But uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Google Ha is planning, that is to say we are working on plans to actually host a qualifying tournament here. Um, the plans are still in progress, and I think you'll find out about whether or not we're doing it. At the same time, you find out about all the other qualifying <laughs> things. What about October 1st? Yeah, the, so like in years past, the tournament registration season will open October 1st. So we should have all the information together for all of the qualifying tournaments and the championship tournament by then. The information will all end up po be posted on our website, ncafll.org, as well as the first LEGO League site under the teams and tournament section. Now, just to be clear, we're not trying to steal people away from their local, from whatever uh, tournaments they've gone to before. We are, in fact, very interested in recruiting uh, new teams. Uh, so if you have a regular tournament that you usually go to, you should stay there, but uh, uh, we're, we're looking forward to it. Okay. So re research project questions. Anybody got any research project questions? Well, when they were talking about come up with a solution, I don't actually understand what you can do uh, with nanoscale technology besides a paper solution. The research project in general, so the question was is, when they're talking about a solution, what does that mean? What can the kids actually do? Um, the research project isn't so much about the, the end result as much as it's about the process. Having the kids imagine, create, you know, understand and research behind the science that goes along with what they're looking at. Uh, you know, be inventive. 
um, justify what they've done, look at the feasibility. So there's a whole bunch of science and engineering that goes into the whole process. That, that process is, is more important than the actual end result. Maybe what they're thinking of is something relatively fantastic. I mean, the, a space elevator, as an example, is something at this point that's a great idea, but it's relatively fantastic. Right? There's not a, a manufacturing capacity that can generate that much nanotube. So that, that would be an example. Maybe they would think of another way that something like a nanotube could be used as a material to build something of, of value to society. Or maybe it'll be used a different way of doing medicine, or it's sort of open-ended in that way. So the, the question was is, does the research project include community service? It's not community service, it's communication. So there's sort of three aspects to the research project. There's the explore, there's the develop, and there's the share. So it is one of the pillars of doing the research project. Whether it means you went and talked to some of the people at your school, or you went and talked to your, your church group, or you went and you talked to the Girl Scouts in the neighboring community, the, the idea is that you went out and you, you told other people about what you'd learned. So it's, it's about the process again. Any other research project questions? So for those who aren't familiar with the research project, five minutes budget for a five minute presentation. At the tournaments, your team will sit down with a panel of judges, do a presentation on the topic that they've uh, picked, explain to the judges what happened. That presentation could be something like PowerPoint. It could be flip charts. It could be a skit. It could be a song. I mean, it's up to the kids how they want to present. Uh, the judges will then sit and sort of do an interview session with them and query them about what they did, how they did it, what did they learn. Who did they talk to? What else did they think about? So it's, it's tweezing into the process to understand what the kids actually went through. But five minutes, no more than five minutes. And if you're gonna do something like PowerPoint, make it easy for the kids to work with and bulletproof. Um, too many times we've seen kids walk in with a laptop, flip it open, it's not on, the batteries aren't, aren't charged, uh, battery came loose, all kinds of disasters. We kind of almost discourage technology-based ones in favor of flip charts or presentations or skits or things like that that are more creative. So the question was is how is the research project scored? There are a set of rubrics that go into all the judging that's done. So not just the research project, but the teamwork, the robot design, um, there's rubrics that are in your coach's manual for all of them. So there are specific areas that the judges are looking at and assessing. Um, different tournaments use different methods. Basically it's a, they did good, they could have done better, um, they really needed to work harder on that kind of gradiated scale. It is subjective. I mean, the moment you throw judging into the, the name of what's going on, it's subjective. So it's, it, it, it's not an exact process. Score, score and judging are difficult. It's more of a ranking. Um, the, okay. the question was, for the research project, should we, how much coaching, guiding should we do in terms of making them really pay attention and address the rubric? Right? How much should we guide them into that process? Ideally, the work should all be the kids' work. Encourage them to look at it. Uh, challenge them by asking similar or the same kind of questions, but not so much as going through a checklist and saying, you guys did this, you did this, you did this, you didn't do that, okay, go back and address that. But it, it's a, a large part of what they're doing is supposed to be exploring, discovering, becoming inspired by. And when you march them through a checklist, it loses that, that flavor and it tends to become more of a race to the end. 
And that's not what you want to have happen. It shouldn't be an end. It should be a beginning. And so at the tournament, they should be excited. And they should end up walking away feeling like they want to tell other people. It shouldn't be the, whoosh, we're finally done with that. So it's a, it's a gray, you want to challenge them, you want to encourage them to grow, but you don't want to lead them through the process. Any other research project questions? Any other general questions? Um, the question was, is where can we go for field trips related to nanotechnology? Uh, Silicon Valley is kind of a rich in nanotechnology resources. There is a, which group has the, is it the Silicon Valley Engineering Council has the nanotech group? Yes. So we're trying to get hooked up with the nanotechnology subgroup of the Silicon Valley Engineering Council. Or the IEEE, or it's one of those groups. They have a group that specifically addresses the industri industry's needs related to nanotechnology. They get together, they talk about the issues. We're trying to get them to participate. We're trying to get them to set up maybe a series of speakers. But they would be a great resource in terms of being able to identify companies. Do they already um, have speakers that come and talk probably once every three weeks on nanotechnology, but they're used to talking to their peers. So what I'm, I've started a dialogue is, can we either have a pre-session or a post-session where they can talk to our first Lego leaguers? Because it's a different, a different talk. But yeah. these are experts in nan nanotechnology. So we're working on that. Um, definitely if people know of folks, would love to have help in trying to get that set up for the FLO community. You know what, last year, when we did, there was, um, someone yeah. in Boston, there was like a marine biologist that set up an online kind of Q&A, and people could contact him. That would be great. Yeah, something yeah. Like, if someone works at WebEx, we would love to talk to them about doing stuff like that. That would be fabulous. And he was specifically addressing questions from the yep. yep. I think what primarily is We're, we are five years behind other areas in First Labor League. Um, compared to the infrastructure and the outreach bridges to the community and to the companies and things like that than other areas. You see everything that First Lego League has, and we've got four or five people on our planning committee, and that's it for 2,000 teams and 2,000 kids uh, in Northern California. So we really need help. That's basically the story. We're doing what we can. That's why we got involved. We see the difference it makes. Um, it's, let me, if you send an email, then I'll send, I'll give you the exact um, person. It's the nanotechnology subsection, I think, of the IEEE, and that the Silicon Valley Engineering Council helps uh, send information out on. Uh, nanotechnology? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they have a nanotechnology. In fact, someone on their board is the head of that section for the IEEE. And that's how I made the connection. Is, we're trying. I've, you know, there's been two talks already that I thought would be wonderful. and. The problem is They're it's just up here. not at the right level. So yeah, it has to not be talking to their peers. So we had some success a couple of years ago with Mission Mars in getting um, NASA types by pre-feeding them the the missions, pre-feeding them the research project, and so they they then took and applied real-world science what projects they're working on that directly connected to the specific missions or to the research project. So that might be one way of getting them connected and keeping it at the, the right level for the kids. It's language and, and topics that they're already talking about.